Welcome everyone to um, uh, this special online seminar, History and Policy, organized by our uh, Trade Union and Employment Forum, uh, called After PO, uh, Will Labour's New Deal Change Things? We've got a, a, an, an excellent panel, and I, I just want to start by think, thanking uh, Dr. James Parker uh, for putting it to, together. James is in the history department at the University of York uh, and his doctoral thesis at the University of Exeter was on the trade unions and political culture of the British Labour Party from 1931 to 1940. So without further ado I'll hand over to, to James who will be chairing the session today. Thank you so much James. Oh, thanks very much, Philip, for that, that kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody, um, and, and welcome to uh, tonight's seminar. Um, I'm really pleased to, uh, to be able to welcome you to, uh, to this session. Um, we'd initially hoped to hold this uh, back in September, um, but uh, the uh, events around the uh, death of Queen Elizabeth intervened. Uh, so we're really pleased to be able to uh, you know, be, be holding the session tonight. Uh, as Philip said, we've got a really great panel of speakers um who i think uh you know all, all of them uh offering i think some really uh interesting perspectives on um you know what's a i think uh, a theme really that uh is very much in public view at the moment um so um the um the as philip says uh this is uh, an event on behalf of the history and policy uh trade union forum um, and I, I suppose I should probably start by just saying a little bit more about the forum and what it does. Um, so um, the uh, the trade union forum is is, is part of uh, history and policy uh, organisation, and it brings together uh, trade unionists, historians, uh, and others in in media, uh, policy, and politics to think about uh, employment issues. Uh, against their historical background, um, and uh, you know the, the the intention really is to think about the ways in which uh, policy in the present day can be um, you know be informed by uh, understandings of uh, of the past, um, and you know I think uh, I think that's something that we we, we hope to, uh, to to dig into in in tonight's session. Um, so. Um, as I say. Uh, Employment relations um, are, you know, something very much in, in public view at the moment. With um, you know, industrial action taking place in a number of number of sectors, um, and uh, recent research by the TUC has shown that um, something like three point seven million workers are in insecure uh, employment. Um, this is something like one in nine um, workers in in the UK, um, and over the last decade, there've been um, uh, you know, a, a proliferation of um, things like zero hours contracts. A um, number of other issues are, um, you know, of, of continuing concern, really, I think. Um, low pay um, and the ongoing uh, gender, ethnicity and disability pay gaps. Um, as, as, as I'm sure you'll know from the news this week, the, um, the present Conservative government has just brought forward uh, proposals to... Um, Increased restrictions on on uh, on the right to strike in in particular sectors. Um, so you know the question really that I think we're thinking about tonight is what would a what would a uh, a Labour government do do differently? Um, so uh, you know I, I, I won't sort of go into a great amount of detail on this, but um, you know certainly uh, Labour governments in the past have been concerned to address questions of employment rights. Um, you know we could we could go right back to um, something like the the first minority labor government back in 1924 bringing in the uh, the agricultural wages board uh, you know right up to the last labor government um from 1997 to 2010 uh introducing a raft of measures um you know, perhaps most prominently the the national minimum wage uh, but various other um other uh, pieces of uh, employment rights legislation as well so um you know, this has been a, a kind of key concern, I think, really, of of, of uh, Labour governments throughout uh, throughout their history. Um, so, um, with with that in mind, um, I, I, I'll 
perhaps just just introduce you to um, our, our panelists for for tonight. Um, so uh, and. Uh, uh, and I should also say actually that uh, that uh, to, to thank Sarah Veal for her role in organising this too. I think uh, Sarah Sarah has been a key part of of, of uh, getting this uh, this event up and running. So um, thanks also to to Sarah for this. Um, so um, our our first speaker, and I'll, I'll introduce the speakers, and I'll, I'll just sort of um, mention a few things about uh, sort of Zoom and how hopefully this will work. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most of you will be familiar with uh, with Zoom meetings uh, over the last couple of years, but just a, a remind you of uh, a few brief things to hopefully uh get us through uh in a in a sort of uh seamless way tonight so um our first speaker we're, we're very pleased to have with us uh justin matters um mp uh justin is a member of the labor front bench uh, and he's the employment rights uh shadow minister so um we're delighted to have justin here um and i think uh, justin is going to set out for us um some of labor's current proposals uh, for what a Labour government would do uh, in terms of employment rights, um, so we'll we'll start with we'll start with Justin, um, and then we've got our two other speakers that are going to respond to uh, to to, uh, to what Justin has set out. So um, we're delighted also to have Professor Keith Ewing with us. Um, I think Keith is yeah, I can see Keith now. Uh, camera troubles uh, resolved. Um, so uh, Keith is, uh, is um, at uh, King's College London and he's also president of the Institute of Employment Rights. And Keith is going to, um, I think, uh, offer, some, offer some historical perspective uh, on, um, on the, uh, the, the proposals that, uh, that Justin has outlined. And you know, the intention here is to start thinking about, um, you know, as, as I've mentioned, the ways in which uh, past experience can in, inform and uh, help us reflect on um, present day policy. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll follow Justin with Keith. Uh, and then finally, we're also uh, very pleased to have with us Verity Davidge. Uh, Verity is the Director of Policy for the Manufacturers Organization, Make UK. Um, and um, Verity also then is gonna, uh, I think, respond to, uh, to um, you know, some of the, the proposals that Justin has outlined, um, you know, offering, offering a, uh, a, a perspective, really, a more of an employer's perspective, I guess, really on on uh, on, on on some of these proposals. So, um, you know, we're delighted to have 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 our three uh, esteemed panelists with us today, uh, and um, you know, I really hope this is going to make for some uh, some interesting discussion. Um, so, um, we'll we'll take each of the panelists in turn, and then we'll open the uh, open the meeting to more general discussion. Um, in terms of in terms of doing that, um, there's a, there's a few ways you can you can sort of uh, kind of take part here really. So, um, if you want to ask a question, um, you can either <laughs> use the um, raise your hand um, button, which you can find on uh, where's that down at the bottom of your uh, your Zoom screen. Um, you should have the option to uh, to, to to raise a hand. Um, and I'll try and uh, when we get into the discussion, try and try and take those those hands in the order that they they come up. Um, you can also put uh, questions or comments or thoughts into the chat, uh, which again you've got a link to there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and um, Philip and, and myself will try and uh, keep an eye on that as we go. And uh, you know, hopefully we can we can feed some uh, questions from the chat into the discussion as well. Um, so uh broadly i think that's how how uh, how we're going to proceed and um and then we'll we'll draw things together at the end and there'll be uh you know then a, a chance for for the speakers to uh you know respond to to what's been said in the discussion um before we before we wrap things up so um has anyone got any questions before we before we start no fantastic okay um so without further ado i'll uh I'll, I'll uh, hand you over to our first uh, our first speaker, Justin Matters. Thanks, Justin. Thanks very much, uh, James. And uh, it's just it's a pleasure to to speak uh, this evening uh, amongst some some very uh, esteemed names. I would suggest who who will no doubt have uh, a, an important historical uh, perspective on on this, as well as uh, some great technical 
experience. So just first of all, to, to explain, um, I'm in the happy or unhappy position, depending on your perspective, having been a practicing employment lawyer before I became a member of parliament. So I have uh, spent a lot of time uh, dealing with the, the law as it is um, and um, represented many trade unions and individuals in, in tribunals over the years. And um, probably the main reason why I wanted to become an MP was because I didn't think that our laws were particularly fair or balanced and I wanted to see something done about that and that is why I'm so pleased that we have this green paper. Uh, I hope you've, you've all got a copy of it. It's, it's available online. It is a fantastic document. It uh, marks the, yep, very good. <laughs> it marks the um, uh, culmination of about a year's work uh, between my predecessor, Andy McDonald, and uh, all the affiliated, affiliated trade unions who really did a lot of um, uh, hard work to get this into a place where it's all been agreed, signed off by a leader, and it's part of Keir Starmer's first 100 days priorities for a Labour government. So we're in a very fortunate position where um, uh, we have got something that uh, that we're, we're very happy with, that's all settled and, and ready to go. And um, it, we are we are going to need to to do an awful lot um, when we finally get into government. Um, there's an awful lot of damage to to recover, but clearly uh, one of our uh, key aims is to really transform the way work uh, doesn't work for people in this country and get it into a place where actually we have what I would class a secure, well, play, well paid and consistent jobs, which at the moment I don't think we do have. As has been picked up on by James in his introduction, um, employment rights, uh, workers' rights don't always uh, get the the full um, attention of, of, of the press and, and the P&O issue last year was probably the, 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 the most recent time where actually people sort of stood up for a minute and said, well, um, is it really right that this, this can be done by an employer? And although there are some uh, new regulations coming in about um, seafarers' wages, fact, effectively, uh, we're still in a position where an employer can make that decision to fire everyone en masse and uh, take, a, take a financial calculation as to whether it is worth them doing that. And that has got to be something that we uh, see an end to. So um, that's one of many things in, in the Green Paper. I think probably, as, as has been touched on already, we're going to have some immediate uh, challenges to face with the minimum service level bill uh, that is coming to Parliament next week. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a minute, but that uh, at the moment is obviously how employment rights are going to be uh, framed by the government as a as a question of trade union power. When I think um, probably most people on this call would would agree that trade union power is certainly not uh, what it was um, probably uh, under the last time we had a Conservative government for so long, and um, we'll be doing our best to resist that uh, legislation. But obviously, we have to accept that with a with a large government majority, it's unlikely that we will. Uh, see much change here, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a little while. I think what I wanted to really try and um, uh, emphasise at this point is that um, we think we've got a job of work to do to actually raise people's aspirations about what they can expect from their employer. And uh, certainly when I talk to my own kids, they don't, you know, they're not in unionised workplaces. They're used to sort of zero hours or short notice shift cancellations. Uh, pretty insecure working environments. And I think there's a whole generation of kids out there who um, really haven't seen the benefits of a uh, uh, mass membership uh, trade union in the workplace and the benefits that that can bring. Uh, I know trade unions are doing, a, doing the, a great job in trying to in, improve membership, but, but there are so many di diverse sectors out there. It's very difficult to have those large uh, employers where there is a concentration of, of people who will um, uh, be, be willing to, to, to sign up. And that's one of the challenges that, 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 that we all face. Um, but I think that 
part of my message over the next 12, 18 months or however long it is before the next election is to, is to really get out there and tell people actually they don't have to accept the current settlement and the way it is actually we can move to a much uh, fairer and balanced uh, workplace. So I think one of the uh, challenges we've got at the moment is that there is an increasing focus on um, uh, the, the gigification of, of work and um, well, we've got some plans to try and deal with some of the gig economy issues, but the Royal Mail dispute, for example, is a good example of where um, an employer is is really trying to compete against um, uh, some of these uh, other companies who are effectively operating a, a, a very insecure model of employment. Well, it's not employment, is it? It's, it's, it's self-employment for workers uh, with all the... Uh, uh, lower incomes for them, all the insecu insecurity and actually intensification of work that that prevails. So we we've got to, I think, really um, get across to people that actually that model of work isn't something that this country should be looking to base its future on. It isn't a model that we have to accept. And actually, there is a way we can uh, deal with that. So we will be looking to try and. Um, and this uh, model of insecure employment, we will be looking to class everyone as a worker unless they can be genuinely classed as self-employed. There is clearly a debate about what self-employment means and whether, uh, uh, as probably a lot of gig economy employers would say at the moment, of course, all their workers are self-employed. But the reality is, as we know, is that because of some of the restrictions that are placed on their uh, time, uh, they really are, uh, or they ought to be classed as uh, workers. And we think that actually that will be a win-win situation for both companies and for, for workers, because it will create a level playing field, which we clearly do not have at the moment. It will make sure that people's employment does give them a solid basis for uh, uh, basing their life. And we will end this cycle of uh, chasing the next delivery or the, or the next uh um, parcel that needs to to uh, come through the system, and uh, uh, having spent a day with a with a delivery driver, uh, you know it was really quite shocking the the levels of the stress and intensity people were having to face, and um, to get a wage at the end of the day, which probably wouldn't qualify under the minimum wage regulations once you took out all the uh, running costs that that individual had to face. So we've got to end that that system of uh, work. Probably the biggest thing that we will be doing, which uh, will be of interest to, to uh, you all, is, is the introduction of sectoral collective bargaining or, or the newer catchy phrase we like to use, which is fair pay agreements. And uh, clearly that is something that's going to take a little while to set up in terms of the mechanics. There will no doubt be discussions about who actually is at the table in those things, but we've seen uh, across the world, with New Zealand being a particularly recent example, how uh, sectoral collective bargaining can actually improve uh, terms and conditions. And I think that of all the things in the green paper, that will be the lasting legacy in terms of driving up standards across across the country on a permanent basis. Because if we can get sectoral collective bargaining entrenched into uh, all uh, parts of the economy, that will do uh, the most for improving working conditions and actually it will improve employer employee relations as well because there will be a proper mechanism to deal with some of the issues that we uh, we know are out there on an individual basis we're looking to um, try and uh, improve the offer on flexible working uh, the government have uh, announced that they are going to bring that in as a as a day one uh, right um, we, we will be doing the same but actually we will be uh, in improving the uh, way that uh, flexible working is determined at the moment. There are some fairly nebulous and broad uh, um, uh, statutory reasons why an employer can refuse a, a flexible working application. Uh, we want to sort of shift the presumption on that, that, that actually you, you, if you can uh, work flexibly, you should be able to, and it's up to the employer then to, to show why that isn't going to be possible and as we know during the pandemic there has been a real uh, sea change in the way people view flexible working uh, that hasn't quite reached the upper echelons of government I'm afraid who, who still seem to take the view unless you are chained to the desk you are not actually being productive but there is a growing 
body of evidence out there that actually working flexibly working from home or from other locations is actually a way to increase uh, productivity um, so we will be looking to improve that clearly zero hours contracts is still uh, a, a, an issue is still you know around a million people employed on those we want to see those come to an end so actually people will have a predictable contract based on the number of hours that they actually do work on average rather than having to sort of wait until the end of the week to see if they're going to have enough hours from one week to the next that will also uh, include some um, uh, clauses to prevent uh, short notice shift cancellations and I think that will uh, obviously impact some sectors more than others but uh, uh, you know the fact that we still have zero hours contracts in 2023 I think is something that we we really ought to be uh, reflecting on whether that is an appropriate way for our economy to move forward. We're looking to uh, introduce day one rights uh, for all workers um, and that will include uh, uh, unfair dismissal and we're also going to be bringing in uh, what we class as a single enforcement body which will enable uh, uh, government departments effectively to bring claims for possibly discrimination or other issues against employees without the employee having to actually bring that claim. We know this, that understandably individuals don't always want to be the person putting their head above the parapet where there are uh, systemic issues in a particular workplace. Um, we're going to, as I've already touched on, uh, try and end the fire and rehire scandal and uh, obviously we have uh, looked at uh, what Barry Gardner's private members bill has done and we want to try and get that uh, enshrined into law. I think that, that you know, the government have uh, made some noises about that, but um, it, you know, we haven't even really had any, any substantive change. Again, with like the, the, the promises they made on p &O, that there will be criminal prosecutions, uh, that's come to nothing. Uh, promises to uh, end fire and rehire from the government have, have amounted to naught. And um, obviously we know we're a difficult economic climate uh, coming up. There will probably be, be more uh, and more uh, temptations for employers to engage in fire and, and rehire. Um, we're going to reform the way the minimum wage works, as has already been mentioned in the uh, introduction. Uh, minimum wage was one of those great achievements of the last Labour government, and um, I'm sure those who were around at the time can remember the arguments that were put forward as to why that couldn't possibly work. I think it's a, it's a great testament that I actually is something now that is considered uh, part of the political landscape and Although the Tories have tried to steal the clothes of it and create a, a national living wage, we know that is not actually a national living wage. But what we are looking to do is to uh, uh, widen the local pay commission's re remit so that actually they will be able to look at cost of living issues when setting the national uh, minimum wage in future. And obviously, obviously, we know with the current situation with industrial action and, and the, the cost of living, that that is something that will uh, be an important uh, uh, a development. The um, uh, 2016 Trade Union Act that the Tories introduced with all the ridiculous thresholds will be repealed, um, along with what is probably going to be uh, the Minimum Service Levels Act that will be introduced by the government over the next uh, next next week or so. Um, I'll just say a little bit about that because I, mean, I know it's 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 very very topical. Um, we've had some very productive meetings with colleagues and trade unions already in the TUC about uh, the impacts of that. There's no doubt that the government are using this as a wedge issue to uh, distract from uh, all the other economic woes that that we have at the moment. It is a very uh, broad. Uh, uh, built in terms of the powers that it actually gives to the Secretary of State. And if you don't if you don't know the details, I mean, there isn't a lot in it because it, it basically just gives the Secretary of State power to, to sort of put all this in regulation, but they will be able to effectively set a minimum service level for uh, a number of different sectors, uh, far broader than was originally uh, trailed with just being transport only. And then um, uh, there will be a, a method by which an employee will be able to give a notice to an individual employee about uh, their requirement to be in work on the day when they would otherwise be taking industrial action. If they fail to do that, then not only is that individual at risk of being dismissed, um, but the trade union is also open to uh, being uh, sued as well. And um, uh, whilst there is uh, 
little detail at this stage because it's all going to be dealt with in regulations. Um, the scope of the bill does effectively mean that the, the Secretary of State could set a minimum service level, which would effectively render any strike null and void because it, it could effectively require everyone to come into work uh, under the under the regulations. Uh, of course, they're not they're not going to say that, that they will do that. Um, but the evidence that we have seen from how this operates abroad, which is what they're claiming in support of introducing this, is that it doesn't actually operate in that way in other countries, and it certainly doesn't actually reduce uh, the number of industrial disputes. So we know we, we're under no illusions that this is a, a significant dead cat that has been brought in to try and, and divert away from the fact that actually millions of uh, public sector workers are, are pretty fed up with having their wages drop behind uh, uh, living costs for year after year. Uh, we are going to um, introduce electronic balloting as part of our green paper when um, uh, hopefully we get into power because it clearly is a, a, an absolutely absurd situation where trade unions are still required to do everything by paper, yet the Prime Minister, uh, when they have an election for a Prime Minister, can be can be all dealt with by electronic um, ballots. We're going to look for better uh, uh, opportunities for uh, trade union reps to uh, accompany people into the workplace in terms of recognition and actually get a, a simplified recognition procedure, because at the moment, those of you who work on this on a day to day basis know there are lots of nooks and crannies that employers can use to to delay and frustrate recognition. So we want, want that to become a much more simplified and streamlined process moving forward. So I think I've probably uh, uh, had my 15 minutes now. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing what the other speakers have got to say. I think we're we're in a really positive place in terms of having a good set of policies to, to go forward. And if we get the opportunity to implement them, I believe that they will make a real difference to, to working people, not just over the course of the next Labour government, but also for generations to come. Thanks very much, Justin, uh, for that uh, very interesting discussion of, of you know, the, the, the various different measures that, uh, that, that a Labour government would look to take. Um, so we'll come on now to, uh, to, to, to Keith um, to, to, to respond to, uh, to what Justin's just said. So um, over to you, Keith. OK, thanks very much. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Uh, well, good evening. Um, well, let, let me just begin by saying that uh, I greatly appreciated uh, Justin's remarks, I and mean, I think um, for trade unionists, it um, hits, hits a lot of buttons. I think uh, there's a promise here of greater job security. Uh, there's a promise of a uh, greater trade union role in setting terms and conditions of employment through sector-wide collective agreements, which will take us back to where we once were. And I think there's also, there are in the, document itself, important uh, commitments in terms of ILO uh, conventions, which I saw the Prime Minister today pray and Ed uh, to justify his uh, restrictions on minimum service levels, which seems to be very, very ironic. But we can talk about that uh, later. But there are the positive aspects of the ILO conventions. I think if, if, if actually taken seriously, will make a big difference in terms of trade union power uh, in the workplace. But my, I mean, just I mean, in responding to, to the uh, 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 Green Paper, um, I guess two points I would make. One is the fact that uh, yeah, it, it looks already dated. And I think there is a need, I mean, one of the problems, I think, of um, developing policy at such an early stage in a parliament is that these policies need to be updated uh, to keep pace with uh, changing uh, developments. Uh, and in particular, I think the main development uh, which uh, Justin mentioned was p and and it's the topic of the, uh, it's on the title of the uh, talk for tonight. So the p and I think, uh, was really, uh, it taught a number of lessons about the extent to which labour protection had been stripped out in this country. And I think there are four issues which I think need to be addressed. And I think the first is in relation to um, and collective redundancies. I think it's not enough that uh, the employer has to notify the uh, business department. I think there are circumstances such as a P&O where the business department ought to have the right uh, to intervene in the public interest to stop the redundancies from taking place in order to ensure 
a continuity of service in order to guarantee minimum service levels, if you like. And that was a problem at Pino because basically uh, customers, passengers were left stranded uh, when they, uh, they were unable to crew the, uh, the, the ferries. Secondly, I think there's related to that is the question about the power of the employer uh, to uh, make redundancies uh, and the powerlessness of the union uh, to uh, be able to stop the redundancies from taking place until consultation procedures have been properly complied with. Now, I would have thought that one lesson from P&O is that a union ought to be able to uh, seek judicial relief by way of an injunction to stop the redundancy until the consultation process had been exhausted and during that period for the contract of employment to continue and for any dismissals uh, which take place during that period uh, to be void. And basically it would force the employer uh, around the table. Thirdly, I think uh, what even more important was what that episode told us was something about the importance of uh, sectoral wide collective bargaining. If there had been a sector wide agreement which said that whoever you are, whoever your employer is, by whoever you're supplied, if you're working in this sector, these are the terms and conditions which will apply to you. If there had been such an agreement, there would have been no incentive on the part of um, P&O to recruit uh, labour at a much reduced rate uh, from uh, an agency uh, supplying workers from a developing country or certainly from a low wage country, because whoever came in to do that work would have been paid in accordance with the sectoral collective agreement. And that is what se sectoral collective bargaining means. It means selling the rate for the job and being paid for the job regardless of who the employer, regardless of the identity of the employer or the identity of the supplier. And this is something, you know, taking a historical perspective, something that the TUC uh, demanded uh, way back in 1931 with its uh, rates of wages bill, when it tried to uh, generalize uh, the uh, requirements or the obligations set in uh, what were then uh, joint industrial council agreements. And then I would have thought the fourth lesson from uh, uh, the, the P&O case, which ties in with ILO conventions, is the fact that uh, trade unions were powerless to lift a hand in order to help uh, the, uh, the P&O staff. Now, because of changes to the law that were made in 1982, other unions could not take action, could not declare a, a trade dispute, if you like, against P&O because they were not the employer of other uh, port-based workers. But it ought to be possible for other workers employed by other, employer, other employers in ports uh, such as Dover to take steps to uh, support of the PO staff, if necessary, to blockade the ferries until a satisfactory solution uh, was, uh, was reached in, in relation to the uh, dispute. So it's about, in a sense, what PO did, I think, was to highlight the extent to which power has been rebalanced uh, in the economy over the last 30 or 40 years. How the balance, I guess, has swung inexorably from labor to, to capital and how there is a need to do something to, to rebalance uh, that, uh, uh, these developments. So that is one thing, since we've got to keep up, in a sense, with, uh, changing, uh, with changes which continue to take place. And another, of course, is the bill that was published yesterday to which there will have to be some kind of legislative response. And again, it's nice to hear from Labour that they're committed to repeal that, uh, should, it be, should it be enacted. But the other question, I think, my other uh, point, which I wanted to, to, to make, was in relation to the implementation of uh, Labour's uh, programme. I mean, regardless of P&O, but just to me, if we take the provisions as they stand. And taking a historical perspective on this, I mean, I'm just going, you know, let me just mention two, two examples. One was in 1916, uh, when we had, uh, during the uh, First World War, and we then had a government which uh, was you know, on the brink of uh, ra really radical changes in terms of the way in which uh, the workplace was to be organized, the way in which uh, uh, workers were to be protected. And one thing that was done then was to create a new government department, which was called the Ministry of Labor. It was done by statute, the, the, the minist New Ministries and Secretaries Act of 1916. And it created a government department which was responsible for protecting 
workers' interests. And that department had as its head a, a minister, uh, equivalent secretary of state, who had a seat at the cabinet table directly to, to represent the interests of uh, workers and, and trade unions. Now, one of the responsibilities of the Ministry of Labour uh, shortly after it was uh, created uh, was uh, to implement uh, the recommendations of the uh, Whitley Committee, which reported in 1917. And as a result of that, we saw two things uh, took place between 1917 and 1921. One was the rapid expansion of a sector-wide collective bargaining through joint industrial councils. And the second was the implementation of the Trade Boards Act, which created what were sub subsequently referred to or renamed as wages councils uh, for industries where uh, collective bargaining arrangements uh, were not uh, possible because of the uh, levels uh, of organizational development that the weak trade unions effectively in the uh, sectors in question. Now, the effect of that was of these you know, the creating the ministry with these uh, wide administrative powers. And that's the inter interesting thing, too, was they relied on the administrative power of the state to encourage employers and trade unions to enter into uh, sectoral bargaining arrangements failing which will fall back on the Trade Boards Act. But the effect of that was to bring within a period of three or four years, so five million workers into some kind of joint regulation, either through uh, sector-wide agreements or through um, uh, uh, trade boards uh, for the protection of their interests. So that is one historical example. The other example, in contrast, was the, I mean, the Ministry of Labour, I should say, was uh, renamed uh, I think by Harold Wilson, unfortunately, in 1969-1970, and it survived, it limped on uh, under new leadership. Uh, I completely, uh, its purpose, I think, was greatly undermined uh, when uh, Norman Tebbit became Secretary of State in 1982, uh, and it was eventually wound up in 1995. I want to compare the, but I mean, the point is to compare what happened in the Ministry of Labour or the, the initiative in the First World War with the initiative of the uh, Blair government. The Blair government also had a fairly progressive uh, program of, uh, of reform of, for uh, labor rights, uh, and, uh, but there was a Ministry of Labor and the Labor government did not recreate the Ministry of Labor, although I believe there was some uh, talk of, of doing so. So this became the responsibility of the, what well, was then the Department of Trade uh, and Industry and Department of Trade and Industry, Secretary of States in that department, successively, if I can remember correctly, although not quite in this order, we had people like Mandelson, uh, Beckett, uh, Byers, uh, and Hewitt. And within this department, uh, Ian McCartney uh, was responsible for uh, promoting uh, workers' interests and implementing uh, this great uh, uh, white paper, uh, Fairness at Work. Now, the problems with that, I think, compared to 1916, was one, the business saw fairness at work, not as a policy to be implemented, but as a negotiating document to be restrained and revised. Secondly, the fact that the big decisions were then being taken in that department, not by the minister responsible for employment relations or workers' rights, but by the business secretary, meant that some people felt that too many concessions were being made to uh, business interests. And thirdly, the problem was, I think, in that context of that framework, there was no cabinet level representation of workers' interests. So all the decisions were being taken intra departments, not inter departments. So there was no, there was no inter departmental uh, discussions uh, apart from with the Treasury or with uh, number 10, but certainly not with other ministers uh, in a decisive way about the form and content of uh, the labour rights agenda. So for me, I mean, just because I was working uh, with um, the Labour team at the time, so that, that was something that always struck me, that comparison between the initiatives being taken by Liberal ministers in 1916 and the omissions, uh, this structure, uh, the, the machinery of government level by the Labour, by Labour ministers in 1997 and onwards. So for me, the lesson for a Starmer government is a very simple one. And I have no idea what the machinery of government's proposals are at the moment, but I know the previous leadership did have in mind that there would be a separate uh, government department, which would be responsible for, uh, not just for workers' rights, but the whole 
uh, labor uh, interests, if you like, in government. So what I would say is really that, in a sense, if the labor proposals are successfully to be implemented, there is a need for a major uh, machinery of government change, which sees the creation of something like a Ministry of Labor, which is responsible for protecting the rights and interests of workers in government and responsible for protecting the rights and interests of trade unions in governments. And I'll just finish on this point. The reason why I think that is one is that at the moment, when these issues are submerged in the Department for Business, Energy, Innovation and Skills, there is a conflict of interest. And it says the same department cannot simultaneously represent the interests of business on the one hand and the interests of workers on the other. What will always happen is that the latter will be submerged in the department to the needs of the former. Secondly, as a result, I think there needs to be equality of representation in government so that worker, the worker's voice is heard at the cabinet table, just as the interests of the business lobby, the interests of the employer are represented uh, through the Secretary of State for Business, Energy uh, and uh, Innovation and Skills. And I think the idea that that department, that the business department at the moment, can represent the interests of workers is just you know, completely ridiculous. I mean, you can imagine now what the toxic nature of that department will be, uh, so ready and willing to provide a bill like the one that was produced uh, yesterday. So we need to have some equality of representation to ensure that the worker's voice is heard in equal terms with that uh, of the employer and the business community. And thirdly, I think if we want effective promotion and protection of workers' rights, then we need to have that separate uh, department. And I just, by way of contrast, I mean, I've just pulled out a couple of documents. One was a green paper on industrial relations and the right to strike, which was published by the Department of Employment in 1980, just after Thatcher was elected, which reflected the thoughtful and careful values of the old Ministry of Labour, which is basically, we cannot be imposing additional restrictions on strikes. Compare that with a document being produced how many years later, 80, 20, uh, 26, year, yeah, 26 years later, 2006, by the Department, by, by the Board of Trades, on industrial conflict, proposing measures very much like provisions that were uh, included in the bill yesterday, which the Conservatives were simply were frustrated from implementing only because of the general election in 2007. So really, in order to eliminate a conflict of interest, in order to have equality of representation, and in order to enhance the effectiveness of a, of a defined, a policy a, 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 and a different set of values in government. I think it's important that there is a, a, a Ministry of Labour, call it whatever you like, but a ministry which represents a government department with its own resources, its own Secretary of State, which uh, represents uh, labour interests. And we've always had, in a sense, only since, well, we until 1982, as I say, until the Ministry of Labour, stroke Department of Employment, lost its way. We've, all, we've had such a department uh, from uh, really from 1916 all the way through until uh, the Thatcher era. And it seems to me to be critical that it should be uh, restored. And we did, I mean, you know, for during the Corbyn uh, years, there was talk about this being done and kind of blueprints were created. It can be done very easily under the uh, Ministers of the Crown Act uh, 1975. And what it means is bringing in powers which are currently exercised by DWP some extent foreign office and some powers which are currently used, uh, uh, not exercised by biz at the present time, uh, giving new powers to the department is certainly enough for this to, to, to do, to justify the creation of a new department, for the Secretary of State responsible for workers' interests to ensure that that green paper is properly implemented. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Keith. Um... I think uh, yeah, lots of lots of food for thought there. Really taking uh, taking that historical uh, perspective on some of these issues into account. I think that 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 question about the machinery of government, I think, is a particularly uh, particularly interesting one. Um, thanks, Keith. Um, so I'll come on now to our our, our final panelist, um, Verity Damage. So um, thanks, Verity. Uh, over over to you. 
Uh, thanks, James, and um, it's been really interesting to hear everything to date. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an employer's perspective, so maybe um, a, a little bit different. Um, as, as mentioned in introductions, um, I'm very here work at Make UK, and for those of you who don't know, we are the trade body for uh, manufacturing, so we represent um, 20,000 manufacturers uh, across the country. Uh, we represent everyone from fourth generation companies with fewer than 10 employees to large multinationals from pharma to food, from aerospace to automotive um, in every region. And actually, for me, it's quite a, you know, it's a proud sector to represent. It is a sector where um, I'm pleased to say wages are 13% higher than average. Um, it's one that really invests in its people um, in innovation um, and hopefully really is providing good quality uh, jobs in areas where um, we need to see more levelling up. Um, but you know, Make UK isn't just, I think, your average trade body or business group. Um, we have a number of strings to our bow, which is quite relevant um, from for this discussion, for I guess our uh, perspective of Make UK. You know, from offering kind of health, safety, and well-being training to manufacturers to make sure they are providing the best, safest environments um, for their employees. Uh, we run our own apprenticeship training centre in the Midlands where we train around 400 uh, new apprentices every year to make sure that we are creating that next generation and pipeline of talent. Um, we offer legal advice to our members to help them recruit and retain uh, their employees and make sure they have really positive relationships with their employees. Um, but importantly, um, and what people don't often know is we've been around for some time, and by some time I mean some 125 years, because we were established back in um, 1896 as the Employers um, Engineering Employers Federation, where our principal aim, and actually it does remain one of our key aims today, was to provide specialist advice and support relating to areas of industrial action. So if you were to come and visit our offices um, in London, um, you can still uh, sit in the rooms where uh, unions and employers used to meet and discuss, and there's a lovely little gate for when uh, discussions got private and they, they split the, the two groups. So we've historically engaged um, with uh, unions and we continue to do so on a local, regional and uh, national level. And I think that we like to think that it's a very positive uh, relationship that we have. And a lot of our messaging, as um, I'll go into, into response to some of the points that uh, Justin has, has raised, I think actually aligns with some of the messaging. I see colleagues from the TUC on the call. And um, actually, we're not always as far apart in our thinking um, as, as people perhaps often think. So if they think about, um, you know, plans on supporting employers to kind of retain their workforce, ensure that employees have safe, secure um, working, we do see that manufacturers very much invest in their workforce, um, whether it's through improving pay. So we've seen, as you can imagine, quite um, an increase in, say, pay settlements this year. Um, it's around, I'd say, on average, the 6% mark. OK, it's not inflation busting. It's not quite what um, some unions are asking for, but it is a lot higher than we are seeing in other in other private sectors. Um, we are an organisation that doesn't go into the low pay commission and call for a freeze in the national living wage or a change to the target. We are one that says, well, actually, our members are paying above and beyond that rate. So let's keep that trajectory going. Let's have something to aim towards and let's bring all of the private sector to with us on that journey. Um, we're a sector, I think, that we see a significant amounts of investment in training, particularly through the vocational and apprenticeship routes. Um, in any given year, um, we used to have, say, 80% of our members would be saying they would be recruiting an apprentice. It's dipped to about 50% recently, uh, post-pandemic, um, but also post-apprenticeship levy. Um, sometimes what uh, government puts in place thinking they're helping employers doesn't actually even help employers. Um, so actually we'd see more investment if um, often kind of government left um, employers uh, to work actually with colleges and individuals um, themselves. So lots of these kind of key aspects that we see in the Labour's uh, New Deal. And on, on flexible working, I think it's often assumed that manufacturers don't offer flexible working, but that's not really the case. Uh, yes, production staff can't always work easily from home. If the CNC machine needs operating 24-7, um, even though we are moving towards uh, a greater use of AI and augmented reality, we aren't quite there yet where the production lines can um, completely run themselves with people working remotely. Um, but flexible working for us isn't just 
working from home and hybrid working. It is things like compressed hours, banked hours, shift uh, patterns over time. All of these things that manufacturers are trying to do to offer greater flexibility. And I don't know if anyone was listening to the Bayes Select Committee session yesterday and Jolie from Pregnant not uh, pregnant and screwed uh, was being quizzed on flexible working and a member said oh do you mean working from home and she said no that is just one aspect of it and I think it's really important that when proposals in Labour's uh, New Deal and anything we see from government we're talking about flexible working we're talking about it in the widest range uh, possible because that is actually what flexibility is all about. I think against quite a challenging backdrop right now of labour shortages, um, quite prominent debates over economic um, inactivity, businesses we are seeing are working hard to retain their workforces and there is much in Labour's New Deal that's uh, very welcome as part of these efforts um, from an employer's perspective. Um, just to touch on a couple of elements that I think we see quite um, clear alignment. I mean, we have, again, as a business group campaigned um, for statutory sick pay to be extended to apply from day one. So we're talking about day one rights here. Obviously, that was in place during the pandemic. Um, we believed it should continue. Um, we think that there will probably have to be some kind of reimbursements to the smallest businesses, for example, to make sure we can keep them open and operational. But if we think about some of the challenges that we see facing employees, even in manufacturing, the reason for short and long term sickness is no longer physical illness, it's mental health. And actually having things like statutory sick pay from day one is really important when we think about things, um, issues like um, mental health. So again, a lot of alignment, I think, in some of those messaging that we would really want to um, put forward. It's also really great that the Green Paper notes that importance of safe and healthy workplaces. Um, we would like to see much more support from current government and even new government from employers to help them invest even more so in workforce um, health and well-being, reflecting that need to address both physical and uh, mental ill health among employees. We see great use of occupational health, but again, we tend to see a large versus small business demand um, divide, sorry, where there is a cost implication. Um, small businesses aren't always as forthcoming and able to offer, I guess, the, the breadth of, of support um, to their employees and perhaps larger organisations can do. I think it's also important, um, important to note on that, that there is a zero appetite from uh, manufacturers and employees that we represent to see any weakening of the current regulations of protections that come, say, from EU law, as uh, may be the case from the current government retained EU law bill. If you were to see our evidence uh, that we gave into public uh, bill committee on the EU retained uh, law bill, you would see that we are no way supportive. We are in fact critical. Do not see any need to be weakening health, safety, employment or environmental um, regulations whatsoever. It is not what employers want or need um, right now or indeed in, in any kind of future. I think in a comp competitive labour market where we are seeing long term sickness contributing to a higher level of economic activity, employers really value actually stable regulations and they don't want to see these overturned. So that's very much our uh, uh, messaging. Um, and this has become increasingly important as we have seen uh, more and more people actually becoming economically inactive uh, due to long term sickness. So you'll see, obviously, the numbers um, we're facing a labour shortage right now, the number of the economically inactive is on the rise. Yes, some of those people are those who have decided to retire early, uh, sell up, go and live on the coast or wherever they're doing, enjoying retirement early. But actually, um, a lot of it is a result of long term sickness that simply government is not really looking at or doing anything to fix. So those measures such as extending SSP and maintaining that stable regulatory uh, framework for occupational health and safety, we think would prevent greater physical and uh, mental health needs arising and stop kind of forcing people out of the labour market. Um, particularly good to see the Green Paper's commitment on stronger family friendly rights, again, in a very positive way of helping to retain parents, carers and other dependents in the labour market. And these are, again, I think broadly supported by employers and indeed me personally, who somewhere behind me has their three year old waiting to bang on my office door and um, interrupt our seminar. So should that happen, I apologise now. 
Um, but more broadly, I think it's welcome that the New Deal proposes bringing together outstanding reforms from the Taylor Review. Some of you will be remember it, have been involved with it, those kind of with new pro proposals and to legislate, which would actually give employers greater clarity and certainty of the world of work continues to change. And that's often what employers want. They want that certainty and clarity. Uh, for us, it was actually disappointing that the current government chose not to bring forward an employment bill um, and a new piece of legislation that incorporated those changes would actually be positive. Again, I think these are things that often it's assumed that actually employers wouldn't want that, but actually they do. They need that certainty. They want that clarity. They need that um, framework around them. And our own focus at Make UK has really been this year, last year and this year around how we build a more resilient uh, workforce for the future. And that incorporates many of the themes um, that Justin has uh, touched upon. And as the sector evolves, I think there also needs to be backed up by more kind of targeted support for training in digital and green skills as we see manufacturers continue to adapt um, their work to progress towards net zero and respond to, to changes in their workplace, such as automation, which we know will present potentially some, some challenges. I guess the two kind of um, big issues that have been um, discussed already that, again, I guess, are attracting a lot of attention, uh, collective bargaining and obviously fair pay agreements. Um, as I mentioned, manufacturers typically pay wages that are around 13% higher than the national average. Um, we are seeing pay premiums at the moment as a result of quite extreme labor and skill shortages. Um, we're also seeing employers bringing forward pay, uh, the frequency of pay negotiations. So where perhaps we would have seen one annual pay review, we're seeing maybe two or three in a bid to make sure that employees are um, being paid more and they can gradually uptick their pay. Um, also seeing a lot more of kind of one-off bonuses, additional um, both financial and non-financial support for employees at the moment during this uh, cost of living crisis. I think we would say, if we're honest, um, we recognise that there may be potential benefits to recognising uh, the particular sector dynamics in manufacturing and when negotiating pay, but it is important to, re to really realise the breadth and diversity even of a manufacturing and its and a subsector and job roles. Justin talked about the need to kind of look at the mechanisms through this, and I think that is something that both industry and unions and an, any new government would really need to think through so that we got it right. Um, the size of the sectors and the variety of job roles can mean or could mean that for sectoral collective bargaining um, and the institution of pay fair agreements could be quite complex, could be a little bit contentious and could be a little bit time consuming. Uh, that said, it could bring a lot of benefits. So we will see how that could potentially work. And on strike uh, legislation, the new, I guess, legislation proposed by government will not have, I would say, a direct impact on Make UK members as a whole as it tends to be public facing service delivery. Um, we find many manufacturers value their constructive uh, relationships with their unions and they don't want anything to undo that. Um, unsurprisingly, we have seen a lot of increased union activity in the past 12 to 18 months, pay related, cost of living uh, related, and I think the aftermath of the, the pandemic um, but employers have tended to note that they have actually reached very positive agreements in a, in a timely manner, and that's what they want to see. Um, employers want to ensure that there is that positive and productive dialogue between them and trade unions. And if I think about some of um, the legislation and proposals that government have put um, to down so far, you know, would colleagues want to cross the picket line of their other employees? No. Will manufacturers be able, easily able to recruit agency workers to fill roles undertaken by those on strike? No. And uh, will manufacturers want to ensure that their workforce is happy and engaged in positive dialogue to overcome these issues? Yes. So again, I think it is examples where perhaps government feel like it is in favour of business and it is what business want, but from our perspective, um, it is not, and we will continue uh, to make that message uh, very clear and work with our wonderful colleagues, with Tim from TUC on the call, um, to really align our messaging wherever is possible. So look forward to hearing all of your perspectives um, and any questions to come. Thanks, James. 
Oh, thanks very much for that, Verity. Um, I think, uh, yeah, a number of you know, really, really, really key issues there. And I think, um, you know, I thought it was quite striking the, uh, I guess, amount of potential for, for some common ground, um, it seems like there is here. Um, so um, with with that in mind, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps open the discussion um, to the floor. So I can see we've got some comments in the chat and some some hands are popping up, so perhaps if I'll, I'll go to the uh, the hands that have been raised first, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll move on to the, uh, the the comments in the chat as well. So I think um, on my screen, I think Sarah, you're showing up first. So um, uh, over to you, Sarah. Hi, James. Thank you very much indeed. Um, really, three very very interesting contributions there, and I think um, like others in the chat box, I very much welcome. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of what uh, Justin, in fact, everything that Justin was was proposing. Um, also, Keith and I go back a long way, and um, I absolutely understand and um, agree with his analysis of what happened in the fairness at work discussions. I should probably confess that I was that lead TUC officer at the time. I'm quite old now, but um, I do remember very, very clearly the, the fraught relations we had. Um, I think the feelings that went around then were very much that although the government was doing a lot on individual rights and there were important new protections that came in for individual workers. I think the real friction and problems arose over the collective aspects of what Labour was doing. And I have to say, if I lived my life again, I think I would have tried not to spend every single waking and half my sleeping hours being frustrated with all the proposals that came through on statutory union recognition. Um, and that's where I think the CBI had a particular raw nerve that we were prodding. Um, and I'm afraid I quite agree with Keith. I think the the, um, the business secretaries of the day did lean rather heavily towards the CBI, and we certainly had the impression at Congress House that everything that was proposed had been run through or passed the CBI before the TUC got a chance to look at it. So I think one of my main points in terms of how all this is dealt with by an incoming Labour government is that we exactly, we really do need, as Keith said, I think a tripartite approach to all this. Um, I think that's essential. I think the, the sectoral bargaining proposals are, are critical. I think they're an enormously important way of trying to give unions a bit more traction, but also get all the parties in together to have some sort of collective pay determination process. But um, again, my word of warning, looking back at the union recognition proposals that we dealt with all that those many years ago, is that this could become a real distraction if we end up having loads and loads and loads and loads of arguments about processes and procedures, you know, and two years into a Labour government, you might still not have set up the machinery that you need. So I very much hope that discussions are going on. I can see the TUC are here, um, but the discussions are already going on between the Labour Party and the TUC, at least, um, about how all this will, will work, but also about a whole range of issues to do with enforcement and my second point, sorry, I'll speed up a bit because uh, I don't want to hog this, is the other thing that we found, or certainly I found very disappointing uh, around 1997-98 was that we didn't really do very much about discrimination law and discrimination law in the workplace. And we didn't look at how you tackle systemic sexism, racism and so on at work. And I think what happened was the, the government was obliged, I'm pleased to say, to introduce the um, or transpose the part time working directive which of course had a massively um, beneficial impact, particularly on women workers, as indeed did the national minimum wage. But I think there was a tendency to say, right, we've done women, that's it. And we could never really get very much traction on discrimination issues. So really a question to Justin, and I'd be interested in the views of Verity and Keith on this as well, is are there any really radical plans, not just to talk about flexible working, critical although that is, and it is very important, but to look at discrimination law and how that's enforced, because at the moment you have a ludicrously complicated employment tribunal system that can never cope with equal pay properly or systemically. Uh, and I just wondered if there's been some thinking going on about how you could overhaul the enforcement of discrimination laws. I'm assuming that we're gonna keep them all in place because they're very important. So, sorry, that was very long. And I hope there were a couple of questions in there that speakers might be able to address themselves to. Thanks, James. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it looks like Justin's had to go and had to go and vote, so I think he'll be he'll be back with us in a couple of minutes, hopefully. Um, so um, I guess um, uh, I guess Keith or Verity, have you, have you got any sort of thoughts on on what Sarah's just said before we kind of move on? Uh, while, we, while we wait for Justin. Yeah, Keith, you're on. 
I guess I don't, I guess on um, radical um, ideas on uh, discrimination law. Um, <laughs> have we thought about those yet? Um, probably not. But you are right that I think that though we have um, almost fixated a bit too much on like flexible working and encouraging you know, women back in into work that we are slightly at risk of um, not considering every part of of the workforce. Um, I think that's what our huge disappointment was about the lack of bringing forward the employment bill, um, because it begin, begun to kind of build that momentum of addressing various areas, whereas the government has decided, of course, just to, to focus on flexible working and even on flexible working, it's been quite diluted in terms of just the, just the day one right. I think it is something that is probably, if, if Justin was here and I said it again, his face when he returns perhaps it's quite missing from that green paper as well i think that green paper um was written some time ago um now we've been discussing it it feels like a, a long time and i think keith had the, the had the point earlier that we need to keep updating the policies and i think almost it probably needs a bit of a refresher um because it's at risk of almost well actually government have done, this government has done this and we need to go a little bit further but i'd be really interested in, in your view sarah on what radical things that we could do because um yeah i think it's time to look, be, be a little bit more radical because we are very much in a different place and a different way of working now that um those sort of bits really need to be readdressed can i come in by that uh james yeah go for it keith Okay, so I, I just see John Edmonds with his hand up, but just uh, very quickly, um, first thing I would say is just picking up on points Sarah made. I think the minimum wage, we made big mistakes with the minimum wage. And I think uh, the way in which the minimum wage was designed is partly responsible for the fragmented nature uh, of uh, working conditions and working practices that we now experience. I think it was a disastrous mistake uh, to base the hourly rate on uh, an hour, no, to base minimum wage on an hourly rate. Effectively, we don't have a minimum wage. We have a statutory hourly rate for a payment, which does not guarantee a, a decent uh, wage, uh, doesn't, it doesn't uh, guarantee a decent income. It puts a premium on being able to secure enough hours, which can't be guaranteed, and which employers are discouraged from are providing because they only have to pay for what they use. They're only going to use you for an hour at a time if that's all they need to, 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 to pay for. And I think, I mean, the, the, way, the way in which the wage has been designed uh, has helped to uh, create uh, some of the problems like Xerox contracts and other problems that we now have to deal with. But in terms of the um, uh, question of uh, uh, discrimination, some of the points that uh, Sarah was referring to. I think there's a, a wider issue here, which is about how some of the, uh, I mean, I think you mentioned specifically tribunals, about the way in which the law is enforced. And I think we've got to get away from this model that the only way by which the law can be enforced is through tribunals. And there must be a role for an independent, autonomous labour inspectorate operating under the aegis of a Ministry of Labour, which has executive power to tell employers uh, what to do, what not to do, and to intervene before cases need to. It's someone to whom people can take complaints, as like the uh, old factory inspectors, who have a problem-solving dispute resolution remit, which avoids cases having to go to litigation before employment tribunals with all the cost, delay, frustration, stress that that entails. So that applies I mean, generally, but I think it does apply also specifically in the context of uh, discrimination law. That was one another big mistake, I think, uh, that Labour made uh, under the Blair government, basically not taking the question of enforcement seriously enough. I'm not looking for alternative methods, uh, methods alternative to uh, judicial adjudication of disputes. Thanks, Keith. Um, John, I can see you've got a hand up. Would you like to come in now? Oh, I think you're on mute, John. Yeah, it's OK. Um, I just wanted to add a memory to Sarah's. And this is about the minimum wage. One of the bad things about the minimum wage was the Prime Minister gave an unconditional guarantee to the CBI that before any increase in the minimum wage would be considered, 
by the low pay commission, he would discuss that possibility with them. So there was a double lock. First of all, there was the guarantee to the employers of prior discussions. And secondly, of course, the uh, low pay commission in, uh, included employer representatives. So you had to get through two hurdles before you could get to a discussion about what the increase should be. And that very much supports Sarah's argument and the argument put forward by Keith that we need an advocate in the cabinet. Ian McCartney did a great deal of work. He worked extremely hard. He tried very hard, but he would have succeeded much more easily had he been sitting as a cabinet minister around the cabinet table, rather than in, as at various times, second or third, in a ministry that actually devoted an awful lot of its time to the interests of what it thought and I take Verity's point here, what it thought was business interests. But the main point I wanted to make was this. We must realise, I'm sure we do, just how momentous this green paper is. It is much more important in terms of improving the work and the position of trade unions than anything that would have come out of the Blair white paper had it been enacted in full, which of course it wasn't. You really could make a case that this is the most important change since the 1920s, and Keith was hinting at that. So we have an issue here which has not really been approached. There's been very little publicity about the Green Paper, yet the effect on individuals in this country is going to be enormous. We must unite behind it and we must make sure that people know just what this involves, just what's at stake here and just what will be delivered in a hundred days, for goodness sake. So we don't want to have any distractions either. That should be a united and very, very strong argument. We need the publicity for this because this would be an election winner for Labour if it was given the attention it deserves amongst the public. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, okay, um, so we've got quite a few questions in the chat. Um, so perhaps we can have a look at some of those. Um, let's see. Um, so Justin's not back with us yet. So oh, there is a question from, from Kevin to Verity, actually. So maybe can we, can we take that one next? I'm jumping around a little bit, but I'm, I'm uh, trying to make sure we kind of cover everything uh, everything off. So, um, yeah, Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin's asked, um, asked, asked Verity about the uh, for a view on the four day week and the six month experiment run by the four day week campaign um, and uh, for your view on the idea of a single employment status, Verity. Yeah, so um, the four day week campaign, um, I think if you'd ask six months ago when it was kicking off and we spoke to a lot of manufacturing members, they were initial reaction was no, we could possibly do this, we can't run operations on a four day, four day week. Fast forward six months and I would say when I'm going out visiting companies, groups of companies across the regions, at least one in every kind of 10, 20 of that group are now um, trialling or fully implementing a four day week. I think for a combination of uh, giving employees that work-life balance and also, frankly, on reducing costs, particularly around energy, because if companies have now found a way of being able to uh, run their production lines um, in four days and they can switch off on a Friday, um, frankly, they are saving themselves um, costs, which then they can use to increase the pay of their employees. So I think the momentum amongst manufacturers is building there. We are doing a lot of work actually to share best practice and um, um, looking to work with TimeWise, um, who have done a lot of kind of pilots of um, how it can work across sectors to see it, see it rolled out. So again, very supportive of it where it, it can, uh, can work and we are seeing it really work on the ground. And I think in terms of a, a single employment status, you know, I think frankly anything that makes um, things easier and doesn't add so much complexity for employers is always welcome actually having multiple statuses a bit like having multiple um minimum pay rates um it's it's something whenever again we go in front of the low pay commission we say no employer knows that there are five different rates because 
they just pay their employee not based on age but based on the experience based on that job uh, they don't change it depending on their 18 21 36 or 64 it doesn't matter to them so i think anything that simplifies um, that landscape actually employers um, are more eager to, to implement so there's potentially something there Oh, thanks, Rosie. Um, okay, um, so I guess yeah, sticking sticking with some of the other questions in in the chat, um, Kevin, you're, you're, you've 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 asked um, questions to Justin, I guess, as well about um, about whether or not Labour support the uh, the the single employment status bill, Lord Hendy's bill. Um, uh, Justin, can I come to you for for that one? Yeah, so, sorry, the division bell was ringing, and so I couldn't quite hear what you what what, what you were saying. I, I don't have to vote on this one though. Um, now it's going again. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's a question about the um, whether Labour support the principles in Lord Hendy's single employment status bill. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's essentially what we're we're looking to to try and. Um, implementing our, our green paper. I, I think it's, I, can you hear that bell ringing as well? Is it, is that all right? Well, it's just, it's just, it's just me who's not able to think straight when it's going off then. Um, but, but yeah, it, I think it, it's really, it's really important. I think as, as has just been said, you, you, you want to create a bit of certainty here. And I think what we've seen over recent years is a number of, um, uh, companies effectively operate business models where, where they want to avoid having any any responsibility directly for, for individuals. And then there's a court case which takes five years to get get to a resolution, and there is some finding that people might be entitled to certain things. But then by that point, the company has changed their business model, all their terms and conditions of engagement, and they've 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 moved on, and that. That ultimately isn't any 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 good for us as a as a society because no one will ever know where they stand and it will always encourage people to 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 go into a race to the bottom. So we want um, we're very attracted to the certainty that, that 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 bill will will bring in because you will either be a worker with all the rights that come along with it or you will be, be self-employed. I think probably what what we need to do some more work on is understanding those. Those people who might not necessarily fit so neatly into into uh, one of one of the, or other of the categories, uh, and and make sure that when we have a clear legal definition, it doesn't put people inadvertently on the wrong side of the fence. Thanks, Justin. Um, so just uh, just before we uh, kind of move on, I'd just like to jump back to. Um, uh this is part of sarah's question um for when when justin was out of the out of the room um which is about um enforcement of discrimination law um so um sarah can i just come back to you um perhaps just to sort of po pose that to to justin now that he's back with us yeah sure uh, thanks very much james it, it was the end of a at the end of a little bit of a rant about sort of missed opportunities in the past but one of the big problems that we always had in my tuc days was with any kind of systemic approach to issues like equal pay and discrimination and tackling prejudice in the workplace. And we just became more and more frustrated with the labyrinthine tribunal procedures that you had to apply willy nilly to all sorts of complicated issues that covered a whole class of people in a workplace. And I, I was just very much hoping that um, part of what Labour's thinking about at the moment is something quite radical about enforcement of discrimination law, I certainly think you should keep the discrimination law, much of which is uh, EU derived, because that's very important. But it's a question of making sure that working people actually have access to speedy redress and that employers who are getting things systemically wrong um, on discrimination issues are brought to book. And there's some kind of means of this joint enforcement body handling what's a very complex area of law, but quite a simple area of personal hurt um, you know, and people just not doing their jobs properly because they're so fed up and alienated by the treatment they're getting sometimes from other workers. That was broadly it, Justin. Okay, well, it's it's a it's a very good question. I have to say, I found what 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 you were saying about 
at um, your experience of the of, of the last Labour government very very interesting as well. I mean, I, th I think just just reflecting from a practitioner's point of view, you you take someone through a discrimination tribunal lasting multiple days. There's clearly a very uh, difficult legal process to go through, um, and at the end of it, do, even if you win, do, do do you really get a sense that actually um, things have, have have improved for that individual? Quite often, the, their employment relationships have been completely de 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 destroyed by that point, and um, it will often have took years to get to that. So I, I think that that. Uh, I can see why why the current system is unsatisfactory. What we are looking at doing is is giving the single enforcement body that we're proposing the green paper powers to actually investigate and deal with uh, um, discriminatory practices within uh, employers. There is also, I think, a question of capacity, um, and and that that's probably sort of more connected with the fact that lots of health and safety. <coughs> Health and safety inspectors are no longer there. I think if we're going to have this single enforcement body, we want to make sure it's resourced properly to actually undertake the the inspections and the and the examinations of, of, of practices to actually make sure that uh, all these problems are, are dealt with. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I can see that yeah, Roger and, and Liz have both asked uh, questions in the chat there as well about um, the uh, enforcement. Um, of of uh, trade union individual rights, um, you know, Roger. Again, you, you you've mentioned that the 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 weights that individuals can have uh, to get a hearing at a tribunal, um, and uh, health and safety inspections. Um, and Liz, you make the point that uh, you know would it be better to put more duties on employers not to treat people badly, uh, e.g., duty to prevent whistleblower victimisation, harassment, etc. Um, so um, I guess um, anything. Further to add on on those points, Justin. Well, um, I mean, we haven't got anything specific on whistleblower law, although I, I think it's probably fair to say what well, it's about a quarter of a century old now, isn't it? And and it 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 does does need uh, a, a review. And um, obviously, by its very nature, at the moment, you 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 have to have a detriment or a dismissal to to bring the claim. It doesn't. It doesn't actually help people uh, bring forward complaints in the first place, but we haven't done anything specific on that yet. And in terms of um, you know the, the delays in the tribunal system, that I think is probably uh, a a public sector wide issue. It's partly to do with the effects of austerity over the last decade, partly to do with with um, pandemic restrictions, and also a very difficult uh, time uh, that. All, all, uh, all public sector bodies are having in and retaining and recruiting staff. Um, so there isn't, there isn't, I think, a, a, a magic wand there that we can wave that, that will we'll get us back to um, fairly swift uh, justice in the tribunal system that we would want to see. But I think we we understand what what our challenges are and why that why why the problems are there at the moment. <coughs> Thanks, Justin. Um, any uh, Roger, Liz, any any sort of you'd like to. Yeah, could I come in on that? Um, thank you very much, Justin. I know that there is a, a line saying you're going to strengthen uh, whistleblowers' rights, which is really good to see. Um, and I wonder if I could just ask if there would you could give us an assurance that that means you're going to build on whistleblowers' rights and not remove their workers' um, employment rights, because there is a private members' bill going through the houses at the moment, which suggests lots of reforms, but one of them is to take away uh, the section of the Employment Rights Act. Um, which introduced whistleblowers' employment rights. Um, but I do think there's lessons to be learned from Europe, where um, across Europe, every employer is now going to be under a duty. If you've got more than 50 staff, 50 or more staff, you're going to have a duty to introduce whistleblowing arrangements. So I think there's some lessons to be learned from there. And sadly, we don't have to implement the directive. But I do think there's some really good practice we could look at. <coughs> Um, yeah, well, we're, not, we're certainly not going to going to uh, weaken uh, whistleblowers' rights, and I'm I'm not aware of that particular private members' bill. I'm I'm horrified that someone has suggested it, but um, uh, fortunately, uh, for once, private mem on this occasion, private members' bills, uh, as we know, have a little chance of success. Um, but yeah, apart, apart from recognition that that uh, quite often uh, that for those who blow the whistle, 
it is a uh, career ending decision no matter what the legal redress is is something that we want to want to to, to, to look forward and i'm quite happy to talk to you uh in more detail about what we might do in that area because as i say it's it's one of those things that we recognize as an issue where we, but but other than a a general statement we think there needs to be more protection that we haven't we haven't worked on that in detail yet uh roger did you want to I mean, uh, yeah, just just to say, um, just been, I mean, I understand why the delays occur at the moment, and I, I just hope that any future Labour government doesn't look at these things in silos and say, well, here's all the nice new employment rights and, and trade union rights that we're going to grant you in the first hundred days, um, and not have a counterpart looking in the justice system um, and saying we, we're going to have to spend money um, in order to ensure that justice is actually delivered and that these rights are enforceable. Because quite frankly, at the minute, um, we, we've got this uh, standard sort of justice delayed is, is justice denied um, because a lot of the cases that go to tribunal are about discrimination um, across the various categories. Um, and, and two years on, um, you know, it, it really isn't helpful um, for, for applicants um, who are successful. Um, <coughs> to find eventually, if their company is still in existence, <laughs> which often they're not, um, but uh, you know, the, there's no justice for any adverse treatment they've received. So I, I think what I'd like to see is government working together across departments and realizing that you know public um, spending in some of these areas is, is going to have to increase if you're going to deliver the justice to people who, whose rights you're, you're improving. Thanks, Roger. Um, Jim, I can see you've got a, got a hand up. I think you're on mute, Jim. Yeah. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can you. All right. Um, just to, first of all, to, to welcome Justin's contribution. Uh, it was quite, quite interesting and useful to learn that the green paper is still in place and, and is, it will be the basis for Labour's uh, employment legislation if we're elected. Um, John Edmonds also raised a number of points, which I think Justin was out of the room at the time, uh, and so are uh, worth repeating. And, and the, the key point, as I took it, was that the status of the um, of Labour's employment minister, uh, whether with, with with a separate Ministry of Labour or or not, but 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 that the person should have, uh, if possible, yeah, access to the cabinet uh, as a minister, as a senior minister. That the feeling was that under the Blair government, that there wasn't uh, a distinctive uh, employment um, minister. With with the cloud sufficient to 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 actually carry through uh, some of the bill, some of the the items that that you've 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 outlined. So I'd be interested to hear if Justin has some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, well, I think I, I I should be using you all as my my trade union rep to argue for a promotion to the the, the cabinet uh, when we're in government because you're all making a very compelling case. Um, the, probably the, the the good news I can give you in respect to that, though, is that um, we have uh, we have a shadow secretary of state already, which is Angela Rayner. She's shadow secretary of state for the future of work, as well as deputy leader. And I know that in um, I think in, in in some legislation somewhere there is a, there is a limit on the number of secretaries of state that uh, can actually sit in the cabinet, but. I, I can't believe for a minute that the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party is not going to be one of those individuals. So um, assuming that uh, that sort of people stay in, in, in position, and I know Angela from her own experience on the grounds of trading in Europe is very committed to the discrete paper as well. We should have that <laughs> uh, very, very close to to the top table. And um, I, I do, you know, I do I do hear what what people have said about experiences in the past and you know one of my laments was that the last Labour government did a lot of great stuff early on but then then it didn't really sort of build on it and and it was focused on individual rights uh 
to 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 a greater extent um, than than certainly our our green paper does. So I, I mean that's why I, one of the reasons why I'm genuinely positive about where where we are because I think I think we have got a leader in in Sir Gear who is genuinely committed to implementing these reforms and I think that for the reasons that that we all know um, there is a, there is a desperate need for us to do 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 all these things. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I think um, we've got a few minutes to go. So we, we may. I, Philip, is it okay if we run over slightly, um, just to cover off? Um, yeah, maybe five five minutes, but five probably minutes not so. more than yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, Michael, Michael's asked a question in the chat about um, board level employee representation. Um, so. Um, uh, and the the uh, the precedent set by the UK Corporate Governance Code. Um, any 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 thoughts on 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 that that theme um, from any of our any of our speakers? I'd say it aligns a little bit to Liz's point um, earlier when she was saying about I think um, learning from other EU countries. We tend to find larger, particularly larger companies, or those companies who have a presence or a headquarter or activity. Um, that expands outside of the EU, UK and into the EU are more likely, say, to have, they have European work councils, therefore they have work councils, and therefore they're more likely also to be those organisations that are doing well, uh, more, such as um, employee representation, representation on board levels. I don't think it's, we don't pay it enough attention, I think, again, if we're thinking about what employers have been focusing on um, it's more been you know gender pay gap reporting for example has been in, in the spotlight um, I would probably challenge that not every employer would know they have to comply or, or explain and perhaps it needs to have a little bit more attention um, but I do think we do see it um, we do see employee representation at board level but I don't think it's formalized I think perhaps the question is if it does need to be a bit more formalized or indeed um, strengthened as perhaps Michael suggests. Thanks, Rosie. Um So I guess perhaps um, no, no other comments um, from our other speakers. I, I mean, the reason I ask is that the TUC has been lobbying for this for years and years and years, and um, it gives workers a strategic role on the board that they wouldn't otherwise have in terms of forward-looking policy. And I was just interested in knowing whether um, Justin had any views on that or, or indeed Keith. Um, maybe you don't. I mean, I'm not. I have. I have a view, but I think it's part. It's, it's an ongoing discussion, chat, shall I say? Um, okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. Uh, let me just come in then. Um, I think there should be both vertical and horizontal representation of trade unions. So trade unions should be represented uh, on the company and a, in a, at all levels of company structure, from from the cloakroom to the boardroom. It should be uh, vertical representation. There should also be horizontal representation in the sense that there should be trade union representation across the sector in terms of setting terms and conditions of employment. But then comes the question of what do we mean by vertical representation? How we got, and what, what is the quality of the representation? And for me, a tokenistic one person uh, a member on a board is pointless. If you're serious about this, then we need to rethink, go back to something like, as a starting point, a proposal from the uh, Callaghan government in 1977 in the Bullock report. Bullock, I think, was then a master of um, Balliol College, Oxford. He came up with recommendations which were called 2X plus Y, which meant equal representation of shareholders and workers with an independent uh, representative. So basically like wages council representation on the board of company directors. Now that of course uh, terrifies companies, but basically if we're saying that companies should operate in the interest of the e equally of shareholders and workers, then there should be equal representation on the board of directors. Companies should not exist only for the benefit of the shareholders. They should also exist for the benefit of the people who work for them, who produce the goods, which the shareholders then uh, get the dividend for. So I would say, yes, I'm all in favor of that, but I can't see any Labour government 
in the present climate uh, embracing that. But that's where we should go, I agree. Thanks, Keith. Um, okay, so we're, yeah, we 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 last couple of minutes. I wonder if maybe I could I could sort of give give each of our speakers a just a, a sort of brief chance to offer their final thoughts before we wrap up, and then uh, and then we'll 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 close things close things up. So um, perhaps if we kind of work in backwards order uh, from how we went earlier. So perhaps Verity, if I start start with you, give you a minute or so just to uh, offer some final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, firstly, thank you. I think it's been a really uh, interesting and engaging discussion, not just hearing from uh, Keith and uh, Justin, but from hearing from all of you. I think it's always, um, when you come to these kind of events and seminars, I'm almost in that kind of big bad employer um, um, mode, but I hope actually what we need to demonstrate is that it's the positive relationships and dialogue that I think can create really good potential policies for the future. And if people do have ideas of how you think we can do things better, then I'm, I'm definitely open all ears. But as I say, I think there is a lot of alignment actually between business and industry and, and, and unions, and we could do, you know, I've had a up for the idea of being you know, from Keith about something very separate um, the idea that a phase industry minister under their brief has kind of workers rights responsibilities labor protections or whatever it is in the bullet points um is probably not something that is workable and actually employers would probably benefit actually from something a little bit more substantial so um greater alignment and a willingness I think to work even even closer particularly in these challenging times Thanks, Verity. Um, Keith, um, any final thoughts from, from you? Yeah, I, I just come up. Uh, but really, I think I wanted to <clears throat> respond to something Roger said. And I think it is, I mean, I think the, the key priorities are employment status, uh, sector wide collective bargaining, re empowering trade unions, and I think addressing the point that um, Roger made about enforcement. But I think, I mean, that the, the one about sector-wide collective bargaining. And one of them has many, many qualities, not just about setting pay, but it's about uh, doing lots of other things as well, including providing a forum for disputes to be resolved quickly. So again, I mean, get, getting away from this traditional British uh, simplistic idea that there is one solution to a particular problem. I think the question of uh, the enforcement of labor rights is a complex problem that needs multiple means uh, 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 to address it, including adjudication, but also uh, administrative inspection, enforcement, conciliation uh, through a labour inspectorate, but also the improvement of voluntary means through collective bargaining procedure. We've never really been able to, to crack that last one. We had to do it before we had unfair dismissal law, before the 1970s. And we lost, we've lost the ability to do this on a voluntary basis. Well, we need to restore it. Thanks, Keith. Um, oh, and then Justin, I'll come to you for a, a final word. Yeah, well, um, I, as everyone else has uh, said, um, thank you very much for organising this. It's been a, been a really, really interesting discussion. Um, I think um, I, I found it particularly useful to hear from those who were, were in at the sharp end on, under the last Labour government. Um, and it does give me food for thought about uh, how um, how we can we can have a wonderful policy document in opposition, but the realities of governing um, may may not uh, may not always make it make it as easy to, to deliver on that. Um, but at the moment, I, I remain positive that we have got that political commitment. And I'd also like to thank Verity for um, uh, speaking tonight as well, because we we don't want to um, be uh, moving forward with this uh, in in uh, opposition to. Uh, employers, we want to work in partnership with them because uh, we recognise that good employers are uh, going to lead to um, uh, good workplace conditions in the main, and, and um, uh, it's how we progress as a nation. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for her to, to, for coming along and speaking on this, and um, and um, uh, exemplifying the, the the partnership that we will hopefully have uh, delivering all these wonderful policies in the future. There's loads more that I would like to do uh, beyond this uh, green paper. Uh, some of the things we've touched on tonight, but there are others as well that I'm particularly keen to do. But I also recognise that there's probably um, uh, a great chunk of parliamentary time just to enact what we've got in here. And, um, you know, we've, we've, got to, we've got to be 
be realistic that that um that this isn't going to be the only thing an incoming Labour government is want to, going to want to be doing but it is a priority and I'm very pleased that it is thanks very much Justin um well thank you thank you very much to our, our three speakers tonight to to Verity to Keith and to Justin um uh, thank you to to Philip and and Gemma at the IHR for facilitating and 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 uh, and, and uh, enabling us to, to to do this meeting tonight. 